natural resources, especially in the Himalayan region for more than 18 years. He handled seven externally funded projects and contributed over 150 research papers and technical articles in various journals and periodicals of international repute. He has also, to his credit, 18 standard books and more than 50 book chapters. He has attended more than 25 international conferences, presented research papers, and won many prestigious awards uh, like uh, SCSI Gold Medal Award, SCSI Leadership Award, Young Scientist Award, Distinguished Scientist Award, Outstanding Achievement Award, etc. He has wide international exposures and visited many countries for various academic purposes. He is editor, associate editor, consulting editor, and reviewer of many national and international journals. Thank you. So thank you, Prithisa, for introducing me for today's this session. Uh, let me first uh, congratulate Dr. Hasrat for taking this uh, very innovative initiatives uh, of this uh, global lecture, local impacts. So, uh, friends, indeed, today we are also observing the International Biological Diversity Day. So I extend my greetings on this special day and definitely we will also discuss, we will relate our lecture to this theme also. So let me uh, share the screen before coming to the main topic today's lecture. Yes, the topic assigned to me for today's speak is nutrient management under organic production system. Friends, we know that uh, particularly the hills and mountains areas, they are by default organic in nature. And we know that uh, in today's time, in recent times, broadly two type of this production system exist. One is conventional system, and second, you can say this organic production system. Yeah, we know that uh, earlier, the system, when our forefathers was doing this agriculture, they are practicing agriculture at that time, everywhere the system was by default organic, definitely we are producing less. That production potential was very less. And with the, uh, you can say the advancement, the scientists, they developed new high yielding varieties, salt high yielding varieties, and we started producing more. But you know that when we are producing more, we need to feed soil with the nutrients. And for that purpose, the fertilizer industry has come up and we started using chemical fertilizers. You know, the chemical fertilizer, if we see the single grain of chemical fertilizers, they are having only and only the particular nutrient element, some filler material or adhesive materials, but there is no organic matter, organic carbon. And what happened in the long run that we have feed only plants actually, not the soils. The, our soils, they become very, you can say the degraded and less in organic matter content, very low in organic matter content. And that's why, again, the entire system is shifting towards organic farming, or you can say adopting the integrated manure. Now, if we see the, source of nutrients for crops. We can divide all these sources in broad three categories. One, that is chemical inputs, chemical fertilizers. Second is organic source. And third one is there are some farming 
farming practices, cultural practices by which we can also add nutrients to our mother earth soil system. Now see, just I am just creating the background. You see, uh, from 2016 onward, I am taking the world consumption or the demand for chemical nutrient elements like this nitrogen, uh, then phosphorus and potassium. It is continuously increasing. That means we are adding chemical fertilizer uh, more and more in the coming time. And if you see the scenario of particularly my country, India, you see in the last decade, we have the highest consumption in 2011. Then somewhat it comes down and in 2014, it was slightly down, but it is again increasing day by day. And the trend is same. Now what happens when we supply these chemical fertilizers, we add these chemical fertilizers to soil. I am taking one example of urea. When we are applying urea, it breaks down into soluble, soluble components and degradable components. Then definitely plant draw some of the nitrogen and unused ammonia and nitrates, they just pass on to the air or groundwater or remain persistent in the soil system. Then what they are doing, our soil and environment, they are started getting polluted. And ultimately, because the soil is completely linked with the food chain, then these harmful effects, they are coming to the human body through air, water and food supply system. And the result we are looking, it is not uh, new things that we are seeing the cancer-like disease in the area where we have high consumption of chemical fertilizers, right? Then because of this, uh, you can say this chemocentric agriculture, there are so many problems, but I would like to highlight only the soil health related problem. Earlier, what we are supplying only the and PK. Now we are facing the multiple nutrient deficiency. We are facing this deficiency of micronutrients also. Then organic carbon is decreasing day by day. So these are the, you can say the basic soil related problems, soil microbial population that is also decreasing because if we are not adding any organic material to the soil system on what, which part they will. So that population is also going to die. And for that purpose, today we are observing this biological diversity day. Now with this background, what is the solution there? The solution is we have to live or we have to adopt a middle path and we have to go for organic farming practices. Friends, organic farming, there are so many definitions, but see, uh, I have taken the definition given by Prasad and Gil. Here, the whole emphasis is on soil. They define that organic farming is a method of farming system which aims of cultivating the land and raising the crops in such a way to keep the soil alive in a good health. What we can use for this? We can use organic wastes. We can use biological material. We can use beneficial microbes. And the aim is we have to get the sustained agricultural production keeping the environment free from pollution. So this is the, uh, you can say the basic principle of organic farming. Even the uh, IFOM, they have given four basic pillars, four basic principle. And in that also, the first and foremost, you can say emphasis is given to the soil health. If we will have healthy soils, we will produce healthy crops 
and if healthy crops or the forage that will be by livestock they will be healthy and ultimately the healthy population now this is again the uh, definition of organic farming which is given by ifom the whole emphasis is here also is on the soils now there are so many practices uh, that uh, the organic farming system works in harmony with the nature and there are so many you can say the practices which can we can adopt but this is uh, beyond the scope of today's uh, lecture so uh, i would like to skip now coming to health friends nothing but it is the change in the soil quality over time because of so many anthropogenic activities and in descriptive terms we can define the soil we can observe the soil health by organic matter content if organic matter content is high soil health is good we can see the crop appearance if our crop is green it is healthy then definitely our soil health is good it erosion should be minimum earthworm and maybe other uh, microbial population that will be uh, in the good number infiltration rate should be speedy up fast there should be no ponding and the soil compactness should be minimum so these are the uh, some you can say descriptive ways by which we can observe the soil health and there are three type of you can say the properties of soil the physical properties chemical properties and biological properties similarly we have the physical soil health chemical soil health and biological soil health but where we get a balance between physical chemical and biological properties or balance of all these properties there we can say the soil health is good and uh, that you can say the a very good example it is represented by three circle and where i have put one star here we have the physical properties chemical properties and biological properties in balanced form so here only we can say our soil health is good if we see the first circle we will find only the physical properties good if we see this we have the chemical properties in sound l if we see the third circle we have the biological properties in you can say the uh, good amount but see likewise if we have the upper part of this these two circle where we have the interaction interaction of this physical and chemical properties their biological properties is still lacking so i mean to say that when we have a good combination a good balance of physical chemical and biological soil properties then our soil health is in a good you can say sound if you see the crop production function we can say that the supply of plant nutrient is in balanced with the crop demand then we can say our soil health is good now it is very common common thing that healthy soils can produce healthy crops and healthy from healthy crops we can get healthy foods and if we will uh, eat healthy foods then we have the healthy population now coming to the point that see most of the areas in mountain regions they are by default organic they have not tested the fruits of green revolution and now the point is that farmers they are not knowing the many sources by which they can just uh, fulfill the crop demands so today uh, i am going to discuss uh, a few options by which we can manage the organic production system friends as i told you earlier here the whole philosophy is to feed the soil not the plant in conventional system what we are doing we are supplying any chemical fertilizer okay we are placing these fertilizers or their granules just near to the plant roots so then so that the plant can absorb whereas in case of organic farming we are applying organic matter in different forms maybe crop residue different type of manure 
then in, in uh, as mulls, then natural fertilizers. So here we are feeding the soil and after decomposition, the plant nutrients, they are av making uh, available to the plants. Now oh, there are various ways and uh, for just uh, to understand in a better way, I have divided uh, in three, four categories. First, uh, we have different type of organic materials that we can go for in situ incorporation. We have different type of green manures, annual crops, perennial crops, then definitely crop residues, is leaves, stem, roots, and stables which are left after the crop harvest. Then poultry manure, poultry litter we can direct and incorporate fields. Then weed is a good, you can say, source of nutrients. So we, by recycling of weed biomass, only the farm weeds, we can get good source of nutrients. Likewise, the second category, we can put uh, the pre-digested or semi-digested manures, wherein we have farm yard manure uh, that we can prepare using crop residues, farm waste, industry waste, cattle dung, urine, and here we can apply this biogas slurry also, then composting uh, like this uh, uh, by using this uh, garbage from the rural or urban waste. And there are so many other type of waste also like sheep, goat, pig, manures. Then third category is uh, this biofertilizers. Friends, we have different uh, biofertilizers or you can say different agent like this nitrogen fixing agent that nitrogen containing vegetations, phosphorus solubilizing microbes, then vermi culture, then nitrogen fixing trees and crops. And apart from that, I have told that we have certain farming practices by which we can add uh, some quantity of nutrients, like we can adopt crop rotation with pulses, we can have uh, legumes in intercropping, we can adopt uh, this, uh, zero tillage or minimum tillage, LA cropping, strip cropping, these are some of the practices which I will deal in detail in the coming slides. So uh, first and foremost, I am taking these crop residue. Friends, you know that crop residue in core person, it is enhancing all three soil chemical, physical and bio biological properties. And of course, because it is uh, resisting the uh, land uh, soil erosion, so uh, it is preventing the land degradation. Uh, almost, uh, you can say, more than 3 million mg crop residue is producing throughout the world. And if you see the Indian scenario, we are producing almost 7 million tons crop residue. Out of the 7 million tons, uh, you can say around 190 million tons is available for incorporation. Rest, uh, the farmers used to burn or uh, use as a fuel or in something in other purposes. And out of this almost 190 million ton incorporation, we are getting 7.9 million tons NPK. You can see how much quantity we can get from the crop residue. And the best, you can say, the residue are the rice or wheat residue. Likewise, uh, uh, in the, uh, I have given one example that uh, we are producing uh, here also maize, rice, pulse, oil seed, different type of crops. And particularly in northeastern region, uh, around 10,000 million tons uh, crop residue we are producing. Uh, in the same way, uh, we are producing almost 15 to 20 ton per hectare weed biomass. You know that uh, this region, uh, Meghalaya, we are having the highest rainfall throughout the globe. And we have a bumper, you can say, the uh, weed biomass. It is very difficult to even manage. And I have listed only four or five species. Every 
weed biomass weed species they have a good quantity of npk content you see in different species almost 3.5% nitrogen uh, almost 1% you can say the phosphorus and 0.5% potassium we can get by adding uh, just uh, the biomass of weeds then uh, in a routine practice you know that uh, farmers they burn the crop residue which is creating nuisance which is creating environmental problems but if we wisely use this crop residue then definitely we have the multi benefits we can moderate the soil temperature we can have low greenhouse gas emission we have uh, low erosion better aggregation we get greater hydraulic conductivity we have high quality organic matter and greater soil carbon stock we have the power of nutrient recycling and better availability we have higher microbial activities higher microbial uh, you can say the population and better root prolification there are multiple benefits and there is uh, you can say in uh, um, recent times one very effective uh, technology uh, that although we are practicing since long time but uh, this is somewhat the refined form we can prepare biochar from this uh, uh, crop residue or organic material whatever we have with the uh, techniques that slow pyrosis so it is very very good alternative we have to burn the biomass and uh, we will almost 50% carbon we can again uh, just add to the soil system and apart from this we are getting some uh, biofuels that we can use as energy so here i have given one picture just uh, i think it is nothing uh, not a new thing only it is a stable form of charcoal which we produce by heating the natural organic material that may be anything in a high temperature and low oxygen condition this is the only uh, you can say the condition the temperature should be high around 500 degree centigrade and oxygen supply should be limited and that process is uh, known as pyrolysis and crida has developed a very simple or farmer friendly techniques uh, you see we have to take a drum here okay the upper part uh, it is having a lead and the bottom part is having uh, you can say it is perforated with the have to create a solvent in the this uh, clean and we have to add the organic material after filling this we can put this system this, this assembly on some stones and just lit it when we are get started getting uh, blue color fumes flames then that it means the temperature has come up to 450 or 500 degree centigrade at that point we can just close the upper lid and we can put this assembly down from the stones and the upper and the lower part we have to seize let it cool after cooling you will get the biochar prepared it is a very simple technique and many farmer they are adopting it then here in our icr research complex for north eastern hill region we are having automatic this biochar production unit where we can feed around 300 to 400 kg biomass per hour and after feeding we can get the produce within 5 15 minutes this is the whole automatic system and friends you know that this biochar is very important or Uh, in managing the soil acidity problems also because the different uh, substrate they have different type of uh, 
pH almost around 8. So in acidic soils, we can just incorporate uh, this soil amendment as uh, a soil amendment of this biochar. Then we have also conducted one experiment where the different combination of biochar with the vermicompost with the F we have tested for crop. We found that if we apply biochar at the rate of 4 ton per hectare with vermicompost at the rate of 2.5 ton per hectare along with recommended dose of fertilizer, we can improve the soil acidity problem. And of course, we are getting higher food yield. Then uh, friends, FYM, it is a very common thing. Uh, every farmers know it, but the main issue is that the way of application of farmyard manure is faulty in most of the cases. What farmers do, they just prepare hips in the whole field and keep like this. But with the any of the rainfall event, the nutrients they they lost. So the just need is to adopt the proper way of application. We have to first make the hips and immediately we have to spread it over the whole field and mix in the plow layer. Then the next uh, very important, uh, you can say the input for the nutrients is vermicompost. Friends, as you know, that uh, in comparison to FYM, this worming compost have higher nutrient content. It is very rich in plant nutrients. It contains high percentage of humus. It is biologically active. If you see the uh, top soil, if you compare it with the top fertile soil, it is five times more in the available nitrogen, seven times more in the phosphorus, and one and a half times more than the calcium supply. Then again, uh, the biogas slurry, uh, particularly in India, uh, in the rural, uh, you can say the rural areas, the government department, agriculture department, they have provided a biogas unit free of cost. And farmers, they are getting done free of cost in their households. And after, uh, you can say the utilization of biogas as energy, the rest of the fermented, uh, after the complete fermentation, the rest of the product is bio slurry. That is also a good source of particularly the nitrogen and also certain micronutrients. So it is also a very good source of uh, nutrients in the organic uh, farming we can use. Then friends, we have uh, different oil cakes. Some are edible, some are non, not edible, but both edible and not edible oil cakes we can use as a source of organic nutrient source. In edibles, we have the groundnut, coconuts, uh, uh, elk, uh, oil cakes. In non-edible oil cakes, we have castor cake, neem cake, mauva cake. And if you see the nutrient composition, uh, see, this groundnut cake is almost having more than 7% nitrogen. Likewise, if you see the castor and cotton seed cake, it's 2% P2O5. So it is rich in NK. We can use these sources also. Then, you know, the pulses, legumes, they fix the atmospheric nitrogen. There is a wide range of pulses. And according to our ecological situation, our, our agroclimatic conditions, we can uh, just use any of the pulse in our cropping system, cropping pattern, or maybe uh, in intercropping. Then friends, grain mowing, it is also a very good source of nutrients. We have different, different green manuring crops and a few of the, you, you can say the potential green manuring crops I have given here, like Sustenia, then Crotolaria, then Densa, then Lucerne, Sunham, Barsim. These are uh, very succulent and uh, very fast growing crops and uh, we can just have these crops and at a uh, right for succulent stage we can import and after decomposition 
we will get good nutrient supply. Uh, then here uh, I have given this example of one this crotal area. Uh, it is uh, two types of incorporation. In situ, there we have to grow the crops, and at the same place, at the suitable stage, we have to incorporate. Likewise, we can bring the uh, leaves or uh, the tender twigs from the nearby forest or from the nearby areas and we can incorporate in the field. That is exit to incorporation. Then friends, uh, you know that azorizomium is a very uh, good uh, potential source for photosynthetic stem nodules. And this is the one of the species, Suspenia, which is having this photosynthetic st stem nodules. Then what we can do, we can have induced nodulation in Suspenia. And how we can do this uh, practice? We have to sow the Suspenia seeds on first zoom. Then after seedling emergence, after four days of seedling emergence, we can apply the nodule extract of azorizobium. And we will see the modulation after 15 days. We can grow this crop up to 30 days and then we can incorporate in the field, main field. Here you can have a look at how this induced nodulation is effective. In the first, first slide, you can see the uh, without addition of this uh, uh, azorizomium extract and in this second, it is the induced nodulation. Then we have type of uh, biofertilizers for nitrogen we have rhizobium particularly for legume crops for non-legume crops we have azotobacter azotum. then for sugarcane we have azotobacter then we have blue grain algae and azola for the lowland paddy cultivation likewise we have phosphotica and am fungi for phosphorus and of course we have the endless compost also by adding these fertilizers the most you can say the uh, advantageous thing by adding of this biofertilizer is that we can have 20 to 30 percent increase in yield. We can replace almost 25 percent of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus uh, which we are going to add chemically. It is a good supplement to fertilizers and uh, of course uh, we can have the uh, we can restore the natural soil fertility. And these are the eco-friendly. These, these are permissible into the organic farming system. Then we can have seed treatment. We can have soil treatment. We can have seedling treatment. These are the different ways of uh, just using the biofertilizers. Uh, here it is just the, the pictures of uh, how we are mixing or inoculating the seed by the suitable strains of bacteria or by fertilizers. Friends, uh, here I have tried to just show you that uh, how different uh, this nitrogen fixing or uh, uh, different type of biofertilizers, they have the efficiency. So in nitrogen fixing, the rhizobium species, they, they are able to fix around 50 to 200 kilogram nitrogen per, per hectare and we can have increase in yield by 15 to 30 percent. Likewise, uh, for different uh, species like azotobacter, acetobacter, azospilum, I have mentioned here that how much nitrogen they can fix and how much uh, we can increase by applying this type of biofertilizer and for which crops they are suitable. In the last column, I have tried to mention it. Likewise, for phosphorus, phosphate solubilizing bacteria, again, for PSM, we can, have, we can fix around 20 to 50 kilogram P2O5 per hectare. Like then in phosphate uh, mobilizing microbes, we can have 10 to 30 kilogram P2O5 fixed per hectare. Then friends, uh, we have also calculated the benefit cost, uh, cost benefit ratio by a uh, the application of this type of 
biofertilizer. Here I have uh, given one example of uh, this azotobacter. You see the rate of azotobacter application is half kilogram per hectare. And this half kilogram will cost around 50 rupees. Then it, that means then for one hectare, we have to spend only 50 rupees. And by adding this azotobacter, we can add 18 kilogram nitrogen per hectare. Now you see, 100 kilogram urea that contains only 46 kilogram nitrogen. And if we take the cost of 46 kilogram nitrogen, it will come around 520 rupees, Indian rupees. And for 18 kilogram nitrogen, it will come around 203 rupees. So we are saving 203 rupees and we are only simply, uh, we are just, uh, you can say investing 50 rupees. So the cost benefit ratio is around one to 7.1. Likewise for uh, other, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, calculated this cost benefit ratio and uh, these are given here. Then friends, Azola, I have discussed in the initial studies, it is a very, you can say very important uh, aquatic fund, very with high, very high multiplication that even in the three days, you can have the double population of this, double weight of this uh, Azola biomass. And it is you can say the multi-purpose we can have the uh, it can use it can be used as the cattle feed in that case uh, you will get the higher milk production it can be just added in the vermicompost unit then you will get the enriched vermicompost product likewise if simply we spread it over the uh, paddock area immediately it will cover the whole surface within few days and definitely it will reduce the uh, water evaporation rate then it will check the weed growth there will no you can say the weed where we have the azola and after completion of this paddy crop the whole azola that will remain in the soil surface and we can incorporate and add a very good amount of nitrogen in the soil system. Then fronts, there are some, uh, you can see the liquid formulations. And uh, in that, these, you can say, these are the bio enhancers. And in these liquid bio formulations, there are so many, uh, you can say the, but the important one is Pans Gavya. And it is, made from the five major products of cow, cow with the same quantity. And these five major five products is cow curd, urine, dung, ghee. Let me just explain how, uh, how, how much quantity we need. See, first, uh, five are the major products we are getting from the cow. Cow dung, cow ghee, cow urine, cow milk, then cow curd. And that's why this product is known as Pans Gavya because it is made up of from the five major cow products. And of course, some filler material, some uh, material for uh, other purpose we are adding like this tender coconut water, jaggery, then uh, ripe banana and of course uh, some quantity of water and the quantity which requires I have just given here and what we have to do friends first we have to mix cow dung and cow ghee in the morning and evening uh, continuously up to three days we can mix it then we have to add cow urine and water in this that solution and we have to keep this up to 15 days with regular mixing in both morning and evening time and after 15 days whatever the remaining things like like cow milk curd coconut jaggery banana we can add and after 30 days 
your final product will be ready and what actually uh, you can say the microbial population i have given the uh, an average uh, composition you see how much microbial load it is healthy bacteria lactobacillus then acid formers methanogens and this is the chemical composition so uh, this is you can say the very good source of nutrients and it is uh, mobilized it is bio enhancer then how we can apply this yes we have to just uh, filter this mixer then we can spray this solution uh, with the high uh, the high volume sprayer and we have to prepare this 3% solution likewise we can apply with the irrigation water system we can treat the seed we can treat the rhizomes and of course we can use this type of material for seed storage purpose friends we have also uh, prepared some of the bio enhancers for different type of ecosystem particularly uh, zoom areas so uh, in nutshell i want to say that uh, there are so many options uh, by adopting we can have a good nutrient supply system for the organic system in organic farming and if we are adding sufficient quantity we are adding we are feeding the soil with the good organic material then definitely we are going to have quality produce better production and that quality produce will provide better nutrition and of course these type of practices they are not having any negative impact on environment and we have a better life so this is my conclusion at the last uh, i would like to thank uh, dr hasrat for providing me this opportunity to just uh, share my views regarding this uh, nutrient supply options for organic farming thank you everyone for uh, patience listening thank you professor thank you please close the slide yeah definitely so you finished very quickly <laughs> before the time <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay yeah now we open the platform for the questions questions from the audience side please come forward if you have something something to add if you want to share your experience from your country so please do it or you have any clarification question come yes forward. definitely any query any questions are most welcome platform mostly the people our <clears throat> mostly the people come from ukraine <laughs> okay as usual as usual i mean this global lecture platform yeah, our yeah. platform has become the ukraine specific <laughs> so next time we will we will we will <laughs> yeah we will think a, a series for the ukraine uh, people so we can yeah, see definitely. how actually how, sir what how different that, this country uh, is you see how different this country is yeah they are actually today today we are having uh, sunday also and uh, here you see in particularly in my region we have the majority of uh, christian population so they are going to attend the church that that is also one of the reason no i 
no i don't uh, i don't agree with because uh, ukraine is also uh, Christ christianity based country you see yeah. there are the orthodox people mostly and yeah, they, yeah. they usually but attend the churches it is a routine it is a routine practice even uh, if we have some emergency in uh, office works uh, even they are not agree to come here so this is the practice but anyhow uh, whatever uh, the situation is we have to perform in that uh, in yeah basically the difference is that the asian countries or african countries are quite you know in the grip of the religious religion you know yeah yeah and um, the orthodoxy that is the reason re the prime reason <laughs> yeah. and india is the hot cake for this you know <laughs> all all kind of the no, no <laughs> religious religious nonsense is going on in this country so this is the hot uh, hot spot for this anyway the the western countries have just yes, come out of it come out of it so probably that is the reason okay mm -hmm. we cannot say much about it yeah yeah that is uh, this, this is not the our topic of yeah, discussion yeah. of course okay um, any any question from the audience side please so that means uh, either everything is clear or uh, either <laughs> yeah. they have not got anything <laughs> okay we we will close this lecture thank you very much tomorrow we okay. have another topic continuously this coming week we have the uh, lectures uh, tomorrow monday and then i think on 25 then 27 28 continuously we have the lectures and thereafter yeah so we close uh, this lecture today okay thank you okay Th thank, thank you everyone Sanjay. especially dr hasrat uh, for, for giving me this support and uh, to all the participants who have spared their valuable time to listen me thank you everyone okay.